This is Conrad Nagel inviting you to stay tuned for the next half hour for one of radio's outstanding dramatic productions on Proudly We Hail. Proudly We Hail. And now another Proudly We Hail, one of radio's outstanding dramatic half hours, transcribed coast to coast in cooperation with this station and presented by your Army and your Air Force. From Radio City, New York, here is your host and star on Proudly We Hail, the distinguished star of the theater, screen, radio, and television, Conrad Nagel. Thank you, Kenneth Banghart. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Proudly We Hail. Our story is entitled Passage to Bombay. This play is what we call in the theater an actor's story. It's a drama of thrilling mystery. The story is exciting, but it's the people you'll meet that you'll remember the most. Our first act curtain will rise in a few moments after this very important message. Who's the smartest girl in your town? Why, that bright young girl next door who just joined the WAF, Women in the Air Force. See her walking down the street in her smartly tailored blue uniform? You'll notice she walks with pride because she knows she's doing a needed job, a job that requires an all-out effort by every American. If you are between the ages of 18 and 34 and can qualify, your services are needed in the WAF, Women in the Air Force. Visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. Learn all the facts today. And now with your star, Conrad Nagel, in the role of Samuel Burke, your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Passage to Bombay. The island of Ceylon hangs like a teardrop off the southeastern tip of India. It's a lush, mountainous island whose capital and main port is Colombo. To Colombo came the schooner Mandrake, her holes filled with cotton and tin from Rangoon. The Mandrake's owner and master, Samuel Burke, was a man of education and good breeding and a shrewd trader as well. But more than that, he was a big man who handled his crew with a firm but humane hand in a day when humanity was a condition seldom found aboard ship. Well, I'm off, Mr. Owen. Hi, Captain. You should be able to start loading before bells. The men won't be able to do much in this heat. Don't press them. We're in no great hurry. Even so, we can have it done by noon tomorrow, sir. That'll be time enough. We plan to ship out on the evening tide. Four days and hardly a breath of wind. Yes, yeah, so I've noticed. Well, we hope tomorrow brings an improvement. Have you taken a look at the glass, sir? Aye, uncommon high, but not uncommon to these parts. I should be back by six bells, perhaps sooner. Take charge, Mr. Owen. Aye, sir. It's been a pleasure to do business with you, Captain Burke. I think the arrangement is equitable all around. With any kind of luck, Mr. Reeves, we should make Bombay by the 18th. Strickland will be looking for you. Oh, now there's one other matter. Come in. Dr. Farrell and his daughter are here, sir. Very good. Show them in, will you please? This is the matter of which I was going to speak, Captain. Hmm. Ah, good afternoon, Miss Farrell, Doctor. Good afternoon, Mr. Reeves. Allow me to present Captain Burke of the Mandrake, Miss Farrell and Dr. Farrell. How do you do, Miss Farrell? A pleasure, sir. How do you do, Captain? Oh, sit down, won't you? Thank you. I was just about to speak to Captain Burke of your difficulty, Doctor. But now that you're here, suppose you tell him yourself. Gladly. Captain, I and my daughter are most anxious to get to Bombay. Mr. Reeves tells me that you have a fast ship, much faster than the packet, which I'm afraid will not be leaving before next week. We should like to buy passage on your ship. Oh. You realize the Mandrake has no accommodations for passengers. Yes, so Mr. Reeves has pointed out. However, we'll be glad to take whatever accommodations you can offer. Upon occasion, we have carried a passenger or two. If you understand that you'll be putting up with a rather rough and primitive life aboard... I think it can be done. A reason for haste is a good one, Captain. I've just received word that my wife has been taken seriously ill. Oh, my regrets, sir. 
I hope we have more favorable winds once we clear port. Well, the weather is a bit sticky. When will you be able to leave, Captain? The evening tide tomorrow. I suggest you be aboard by two bells. That's five o'clock. And uh, how much will you charge for passage? Be no charge, sir. The Mandrake is bound for Bombay. It'll be no hardship. I wouldn't think of it, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Those are the only conditions under which I'll take you. You're in trouble. You need help. I'm happy to assist. The following day saw no change in temperature. It continued hot and humid, but toward eventide, a fitful breeze sprang up from out the northeast. It seemed to assure some headway and perhaps a break in the weather. The doctor and his daughter arrived at the dockside at the appointed time. They made quite a contrast. He, a tall, thin man with a bony, forlorn-looking face, and she, a small, quiet slip of a woman with large, soft eyes, filled with a strange emptiness. I gave up my cabin to her and placed her father in the wardroom. All secure, sir. You'll fill out the log, Mr. Owen. This breeze won't last. <laughs> it may freshen. There's a nasty swell, Captain. The sea looks like lead. Helmsman, head her up a point. Up a point she is, sir. Oh, I should think you'd be in better spirits, Mr. Owen, with a pretty young woman aboard. She is a looker, isn't she, sir? <laughs> You'll excuse me while I have a word with the um, uh, looker and her father. Yeah, good evening. Oh. Good evening. I hope we weren't in the way. Not at all, Doctor. Well, we don't seem to be going very fast. No, I'm afraid not. However, my last passenger was a minister. When we needed wind, he prayed for it, and it blew up a gale. <laughs> Should you be tempted to pray, please do so with moderation. <laughs> Helen... I'm sorry. I, I sometimes forget. Well, uh, uh, we'll hope the weather improves by morning. Well, I think we can go below now. I'm sure you must be famished. This, this heat doesn't exactly stimulate the appetite. Nor does this swell. I'm sure you'll both feel better after you've eaten. Oh, eaten? Eaten? Sweeten? Huh. Uh, <clears throat> my, my daughter has a droll sense of humor. You, you, you must excuse her. Hi, Mr. Owen. We're barely making steerage way, sir. I'm aware of that. The glass is dropping. Good. Means a change. I don't think the mandrake takes to being becalmed. Nor do I, sir. Especially with this dirty cross swell. Mr. Owen, what you're trying to convey is the feeling that this has all the earmarks of typhoon weather. Is that correct? I had it in mind, sir. Well, I've had it in mind since yesterday. However, this is not the China Sea, and you know as well as I that typhoons in this area are most uncommon. I know, sir. But even granting that such an occurrence is possible, we'll have ample time to put into port before it strikes. Should it come out of the Arabian Sea, we'll run before it back to Colombo. If it comes out of the Indian Ocean, we'll put into Trivandrum. Should it come out of the Andaman Sea, we'll make for the Lokaidi. Does that put your fears at rest, Mr. Owen? I... I'm sorry, sir. Nonsense, man. A good mate is an observant one. It's your job to be aware of these things <laughs> and to worry about them if you see fit. Well, sir... If I may be so bold, there's, there's another matter I'm worried about. Yeah. What's that? The lady, Miss Farrell. Hmm. At the table, she seemed, well, I don't know, but she said things that didn't seem to make sense. And she'd laugh for no reason at all. Kind of gave me the creep. Yes, I can't deny that. Oh, I... Captain? Captain Burke? Take charge, Mr. Owen. Oh, there you are, Captain. Yeah, isn't it rather late, Miss Farrell? Oh, no, I think it's rather early. Besides, I get all mixed up with your bells. They, they don't make sense. <laughs> I, I thought perhaps you'd like to show me around your ship. Well, <laughs> this is hardly a good time for a tour, Miss Farrell. It's a very dark night. Oh, I know, but isn't that the best time, though? I like the dark. So much better than the light. It, it hides things. Have you things to hide, Captain? You're such a big, strong-looking man, even in the dark. Are your arms strong, Captain? Now I'm teasing you. I shouldn't tease Dr. Farrell. I, I mean, Father says I... Helen! Are we here, Dr. Farrell, over with the mizzen mast? Oh, why did you tell him? He'll only spoil things. 
He always spoils things. Oh, and I think it's time you were in bed. It's been a long day. Yes. It's been a long day, such a long day. And the nights are so dark and empty. Good night, Captain. Ma'am. Fairly awake? Yes, Captain. I'm awake. I think we'd better have a talk. A talk? I'm not blind, Doctor, nor am I a fool. Is it that obvious? It's becoming increasingly more so. <sighs> I'm the one who's a fool, thinking I could deceive you. Is... is she... demented? I'd better tell you the whole story. She's not my daughter. She's the daughter-in-law of a friend of mine in Ceylon. Her name is really Ellen Cartwright. She and her husband and child came out for a visit a little over a year ago. One day, the three of them went for a sail. A sudden squall came up. The boat capsized. She was the only survivor. Never did get the complete story other than that she saw her husband and child drown. Well, the shock, of course, was very great. Ellen was very ill for some months, and when she recovered, she seemed to have no memory of what had happened. Most of the time, she's perfectly rational. But I'm afraid the association of being on board ship again has had a bad effect. Well, I'm not a doctor, but it seems obvious to me that it naturally would. And I realize that, but it was felt by her family and myself that the sooner we could get her away from here, back to her own people, the better chance she'd have for recovery. Did, uh, did Reeves know about this? No, I, I deceived him as well. Hmm. How is it she plays the part of your daughter? Well, she's like a child in that respect. I, I made her believe that she is my daughter. I see. You were afraid to take her on the packet. Yes, I thought this would be, well, better from all standpoints. How does she act when a storm comes up? I, uh, I'm afraid her actions border on the uncontrollable. There's a subconscious connection. Uh, why do you ask? In other words, the worst condition you could put her in would be on board ship in a storm. Well, yes, but I'd... Forgive me for being so blunt, but you're not only a fool, you're an idiot. I... Uh... I am sorry I've deceived you, You'll sir. You'll be more so before this voyage is done. But I... I don't understand. Do you know anything at all of weather? No, no, I'm afraid I don't. That instrument hanging there is a barometer. For the last two hours, it's been dropping steadily. The sea swell has been growing more violent. There's not a breath of wind, and the air is thick and humid. Yes, I'd noticed, but... What does it mean? It means, sir, if there was any breeze at all, I'd come about and head back for Colombo as fast as I could. We're in for a bad blow, perhaps a typhoon. And I don't look forward to having a madwoman aboard my ship when it comes. Conrad Nagel, starring in the role of Samuel Burke in the proudly we hail production Passage to Bombay, will return in just a moment for the second act. Here's a special message for you young women. Next time you see a WAF, woman in the Air Force, take a good look. You're looking at the smartest woman of the year in Air Force Blue. It isn't just the uniform. She's demonstrating her smartness in another way, even more important. She's found a career that means something. She's serving in the world's greatest Air Force, and she's proud of it. She's working on equal terms with the men of the Air Force. She has good pay, comfortable quarters, opportunities for travel, and the deep sense of personal accomplishment that goes with doing a needed job well. She's working in interesting fields, as a technician in medical and dental fields, in air traffic, photography, or one of many others. She's learning new skills and liking it a lot. In short, she's the smartest woman of the year. If you are a young woman between 18 and 34 and can qualify, you can join her in that smart uniform. All you have to do is stop in at your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now with your star, Conrad Nagel, in the role of Samuel Burke, we present the second act of Passage to Bombay. A pretty kettle of fish. For some reason, the phrase stuck in my mind. Perhaps I'd been unduly harsh to the doctor, but under the circumstances, I could afford him no sympathy. 
My sympathy lay with a poor tortured woman whose sanity was balanced on a thin line and must certainly topple over the brink of what was to come. Through the night, the glass continued to fall. We could no longer hold steerage way, and the ever-increasing swell was sweeping us out into the Indian Ocean. The mandrake heaved uneasily, her canvas limp and useless. I could only hope when the wind sprang up, we would have time enough to run for Nagar Coil on the tip of the Indian mainland. The sun the next morning rose as an angry copper ball. And when I saw the smoky, yellowy smudge of clouds off our starboard beam, I called Mr. Owen to the quarter deck. Well, Owen, it seems as though our worst fears are to be confirmed. Aye, sir. I want all canvas off her, but her jib and topsails. They'll not last long on this, sir. I want all hands off watch, battening down above and below decks. When it hits, we'll try to run. We may be able to stay on the edge of it. You're an optimist, sir. That's right, Mr. Mate. You'd do better to have a little of it yourself. Sorry, sir. It must be the heat. Or the fact that I went through a typhoon. Well, then, there should be nothing new about it to you. You seem to have survived it well enough. I was on land, sir. No. There wasn't a ship in the area that rode it out safely. Dr. Farrell? Yes, Captain. How is she? She's still asleep, I believe. I haven't disturbed her. Well, that's a help. The wind's come up. We seem to be making good time. Let's hope it's good enough. We're running for the tip of the Indian mainland. If the full force of the storm hits us before we get there, we'll have no other alternative but to ride it out. You can't go on sailing? Not with bare poles. The wind will shred our canvas as though it were tissue paper. It's a typhoon? Yes. I'll have my hands full. We all will. It'll be up to you to see to it that your patient is kept in her cabin even if you have to use force. If we're caught up in the full strength of this blow, it'll take all the ability of every man on this ship to see that we survive. And even then, our ability may not be enough. It'll be your job to see that we have no outside problems to contend with. Is that clear? Perfectly, Captain. I... The wind woke me. I don't like it. Make it stop. It's laughing at me. Doctor, she's in your care. Please, make the wind stop. Make it stop. Ellen, my child, there's nothing in the wind. It won't hurt you. It's going to take you home. those men been on the helm? Since they came on watch, sir. Have them relieved. No one's to be on the helm more than two hours at a stretch. We've got to conserve our strength. Aye, sir. Captain! Captain, the topsails have gone. They're in shreds. I'm not blind, Mr. Owen. Have her brought into the wind. We'll have to try and ride her out as best we can. <laughs> All the rest of that day and on into the night, we battled the ever-increasing fury of the storm. Our canvas gone, we could no longer run before its might. Instead, we had to turn and face its brutal force. Great thunderous seas rose about us. And it was more the Almighty's work than our seamanship that we were not engulfed and completely swallowed up. As it was, an occasional wave found its mark. And the mandrake would shudder from stem to stern under crashing tons of swirling water that fell upon her with unearthly force. Beaten to my knees, gasping and choking, I would think, well, this is the end. She can never rise out of this. But always, somehow, she did. And I would regain my feet with the insane, gibbering wind tearing at me. The men on the helm were lashed to it. I had a line around my waist tied to the mainmast. The rest of the crew under the mate's direction were below deck, some on the pumps, some in the cargo holds. But every man aboard ship was fighting grimly to keep the mandrake afloat. And as time passed, it seemed as though the tide of fate had turned against us. Captain! Ahoy, Captain! Ahoy, Owen! Make your way carefully, man! Captain! Captain! Board holds her. She's opening up. The pumps aren't working fast enough, sir. There's two feet of water in the hole. Hold on. Hold on. Keep her headed up. Owen. All right, Owen. Aye, sir. All right, sir. Good. Now I'll have a look below. Tie this line around you. I'll send two new men for the helm. Steady as she goes. For heaven's sake, don't let her fall off, or we're done. Mm -hmm. 
All right, men. How fast is it rising? We've got about two and a half feet here now, Captain. Have the pumps brought in from the main hold. O'Brien, bring four men. We'll get at it. Look lively. Stevens, Lopez, relieve the men on the helm. Even with the pumps from the main hold, it was a losing battle. But still, we had to fight it as best we could and pray that the storm would abate before the mandrake became a sea coffin. It was close to dawn when I left the forward hold and made my way aft, planning to go on deck and take over for Mr. Owen. Then, I suddenly thought of the doctor and his charge and felt it would be a good idea to look in on them. Dr. Farrell. Dr. Farrell. Dr. Fa <laughs> I knew you'd come. I knew someone would come. You brought the storm. Calm yourself. <laughs> bang, bang. <laughs> Don't come near me. Don't come near me. I know you. I know all of you. Trying to trick me? Well, you can't do it. I'll kill you with this gun, just like I did him. Oh, he's in there, all right. Just as quiet and peaceful. <laughs> well, now. Now, wait a minute, miss. May I... Have a look. Oh, yes. Do by all means have a look. Have a good look at the poor man. Well, if the storm was a threat to my life, then this poor wild-eyed creature with a revolver gripped in her hand was just as great a one and just as capricious. Took every bit of nerve I had to turn my back on her, knowing she might shoot me without thought or reason. There. The doctor lay just inside the cabin door. She was right. He was lying quite still, but it took only a moment to realize he wasn't dead, only superficially wounded. The bullet had grazed his skull. I picked him up with ease and placed him in the bunk. Why did you do that? I didn't tell you you could do that. Well, now, now you mustn't be unkind to the dead. Oh, the dead? Oh, no. No, you must never be unkind to them. Stand over there. What? What are you going to do? I'll make you dead, too, if you don't stop this awful wind. Everything's sliding. I'm gone. I'm breaking. I hate to see things break. Stop it. Stop it. What do you hear? No, no. You must be tired from standing and holding on like that. Why don't you sit down in that chair? It's fastened to the floor. You stay away from me. What are you going to do with that rope? I'll tie the doctor in the bunk so he won't roll out. Remember, we must be kind to him. I'm going to kill you right now. They killed everything I had a long time ago. Why should you live? Put down that gun. Put it down at once. <laughs> he tried to order me to. Look out! Well, Mr. Owen, <laughs> now you can say you've lived through two typhoons. It wasn't the kind that comes out of the China Sea, sir, or we wouldn't be here now. A small typhoon is better than none at all. I owe it my life. Owe oh, it your life, sir? Another six hours of it, and why, we'd have been in Davy Jones' locker. <laughs> Always thinking of the worst, Mr. Owen. How's the doctor? Oh, he's got a headache, but... He'll do. It's the other one that I'm thinking about, sir. Yes. She's, um, she's calmer? Never a word out of her. Just sits there staring at nothing. The storm must have been too much for her. Are you sure, sir, that it's necessary to keep a man on watch down there at all times? At all times, Mr. Owen. But, but, sir, she's such a quiet, harmless little body. Yes. You saw the doctor's head. No, he probably did it himself, sir. Slipping and slopping around the way we were. Oh. If you ask me, she couldn't harm a flea. But I didn't ask you, Mr. Owen. You'll keep a man down there with her till we make port. Aye, aye, sir. So it was a strange paradox to think upon as now the mandrake limped painfully under shortened sail for the safety of the mainland. The 
typhoon had nearly ended all our lives. And yet, as I said to Owen, I owed it mine. For Ellen Cartwright had been in the act of shooting me dead when the most violent sea we had yet sustained crashed over our decks, nearly putting the mandrake on our beam's end and knocking us both into a corner. The blow stunned her. And after lashing her in the wardroom bunk, I'd made my way up onto the deck. Now it was all but done. I'd not seen fit to enlighten anyone concerning my actions. When we reached port, they would take Ellen Cartwright ashore and out of my life. She was truly a tragic and lost creature. Someone to forget. But I knew no matter what seas I sailed or in what kind of weather, I would never forget the look of her. <laughs> Or shake her <laughs> mad laughter from out of my mind. <laughs> Our star, Conrad Nagel, will return in just a moment with a word about next week's show. The woman in the Air Force is a woman who has found that it's smart to serve her country. She wears the trim WAF uniform, and she has a good future in a good outfit. See her walking down the street in her smartly tailored blue uniform? You'll notice she walks with pride because she knows she's doing a needed job, a job that requires an all-out effort by every American. If you are between the ages of 18 and 34 and can qualify, your services are needed in the WAF, Women in the Air Force. Visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. Learn all the facts today. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and the United States Air Force Recruiting Service. Proudly We Hail stars Conrad Nagel. Supporting Mr. Nagel in the role of Ellen Cartwright was Helen Christian. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking, and here again is your host and star, Conrad Nagel. Friends, we hope you'll be with us over this same station for Proudly We Hail next week. Our play takes us to Spain in 1588 for a story of Sir Francis Drake and the Spanish Armada and is entitled Hue and Cry. Until then, goodbye.